I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. Again, I'm requesting order. Welcome to the College of Complexes. Again, I'd like to request that uh, the attention be placed to the festivities up here. And uh, first off, my name is Tim. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we're going to have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker is going to speak for up to about an hour. Then we'll take questions and answers. And after that, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. I do know we have tonight, we have a speaker. And her name is Natalie Lynn Lichtenberg. One of 80 plus national chapters, a, bi a non bipartisan group of local climate activists comprised of trained climate reality leaders working to support the international nonprofit's mission of catalyzing a global solution to the climate crisis by make, making urgent action a necessity across every level of society. We combat climate change by working to make the transition to clean energy a priority in the federal, state, and local level and rally around climate reality's organizational priorities. Additionally, we launch local projects and initiatives as developed by Chicago members to accelerate climate action in our regional area. Let's welcome Natalie Lynn Lichtenberg. Thank you so much. My name is Natalie Lynn Lichtenberg. I'm actually related to Dr. Robert Lichtenberg. Um, so I'm here from the Climate Reality, Reality Projects. I was trained with Al Gore in 2015 in Miami, and we're here to talk about climate change. How many people here have grandchildren? How many people here want their planet to be here for their grandchildren? <laughs> so this is the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that any of us have ever seen. This was taken on the last Apollo missions and it has changed the way that humanity thought about our common home ever since. Do you want to hold that or do you want me to remount it for you? Uh, Okay, so it reminds us that we're all connected. Um, we're working together uh, in regards to helping our planet. So my personal story is that when I was younger, my parents took me on a vacation every summer, usually a driving vacation where we drove 68 hours every day, and we saw as many national parks, state parks as we could. So this really helped me to see the United States uh, fully from the East Coast to the West Coast. This picture was taken uh, somewhere probably in Utah or Colorado, and we were at the side of the road at a one of those rest stops and I was looking at these black eyed Susans which is my favorite flower and I went to pick it and my dad sharply yelled at me saying don't you dare touch that um, keep it as it is respect it admire it but don't touch it don't alter it in any way so ever since then I have um, it was a life-changing moment for me that I began to respect nature and just to only look and admire and not to alter in any way that I that I couldn't. The sky is not just a vast and limited expanse it, um, as it appears to us when we're standing on, on the ground. It actually is a it is a shell of atmosphere that has two layers. So the two layers are the troposphere and the stratosphere. So actually they're very thin. So currently we are putting 
110 million tons of man-made global pollution into the atmosphere every single day. This warming pollution is um, going into the atmosphere every 24 hours. So here's the basic science of global warming. This has been understood by scientists since the 1800s. Unfortunately, no, but... Uh. That's okay. So energy from the sun comes to the earth in the form of light. That energy is absorbed by the earth and warms it. Some of that energy is re-rated re out to the earth in the form of heat. So when it hits the ground, it is reflected back out. Some of that outgoing heat is trapped in by the atmosphere, which is a good thing. It helps to keep our planet stable at a temperature and uh, chemical level. Now, however, we've been thickening the atmosphere by filling it with heat trapping pollution. So more heat energy is trapped, and this is warming our, our planet at an unprecedented rate. So there's many sources of man-made pollution. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with them. Agricultural practices, coal plants, the thawing of the um, glaciers actually has a lot of methane under them, coal mining, um, oil production, and so forth. So fossil fuels still provide more than 80% of the world's energy. Their use and emissions has gone up dramatically since World War II. Notice that in the last few years, though, there has been a leveling off as the world is slowly uh, moving away from the fossil fuels. So as a result of this pollution being trapped in the atmosphere, the global te temperatures have risen dramatically. So 16 out of the 17 hottest years have occurred since the year 2001. So um, the past 20 um, the past 20 hottest years have occurred since 1998. So 2017 was hotter than 2016. 2016 was hotter than 2015, and so forth. Heat itself is a problem in many um, parts of the world. Um, you know, just being outside, especially for our elder population, they're not able to withstand the heat and it causes medical emergencies. So this is a photo of a man, a man who has succumbed to the heat exhaustion um, outside in Boston, Massachusetts. On a global basis, more than 90% of all extra heat energy trapped by our atmosphere is going into the oceans. This heat makes ocean-based storms like hurricanes, typhoons, and cyclones stronger and more destructive. So this is obviously, um, it's the slide is not very old because it doesn't have the most recent hurricanes, but in August 2015, three category four hurricanes occurred simultaneously in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And that's the first time that this has ever happened. So we're like way more familiar with hurricanes and stuff being based in the Caribbean, so uh, they're becoming more frequent on the Pacific side. So this slide is looking at um, the Earth over the North Pole, and you're seeing the Northern hemis Hemisphere Jet Stream. That is actually not, I skipped a slide. So this is um, the hydrological cycle where we have evaporation, which then obviously what goes up has to come down, comes down as precipitation, 
And the water returns to the sea, where with the warmer temperatures, we have the evaporation again. So this slide is looking at the Earth from the North Pole. We're looking at the Northern Hemisphere jet stream. So the pattern of the jet stream is getting way more wavier and erratic. Where you can see like over the Chicago area, the jet stream is actually coming way down. It's way more dramatic. So, uh, you know, like in the past winters, we've had where the cold weather from Canada is coming down, like and it's in the negatives, and then it's just like sitting there, and we're just like waiting for it to go, to go away. And it's because these jet streams are getting stagnated. Whereas before, they didn't used to do that. So this is kind of a famous photo. It's the extreme precipitation events <clears throat> producing more rain and more common since the 1950s. Did I skip a slide again? So this is a superstorm cell. Um, with the column of rain at its center, and this is actually in Montana just a few years ago. Kind of cool, but I wouldn't want to be living there. So this is a photo of a wet microburst uh, right over Phoenix, Arizona, which as we know is usually very dry. So um, the wet microbursts are usually referred to as rain bombs. So they require very, very specific conditions to occur. So I will just say that the conditions are right and it creates a lot of rain evaporation from the ocean. It's super concentrated in that cloud and just because of the air temperature and pressures, it just pounds the earth then. So sometimes people wonder how global warming can be blamed for causing more precipitation and flooding and at the same time, more drought. The extra heat that's been trapped actually leads to both. And as the climate changes, precipitation patterns change, leaving some places with less rainfall, rainfall than before. So this is Houston. Um, we're all familiar with the uh, hurricane in Houston. Climate change can influence hurricanes in several ways. Since 1995, more than 90% of excess heat retained by Earth has been absorbed by the oceans. Warmer ocean temperatures, which are like fuel for tropical storms, can result in more intense storms, rapid, rapid intensification of storms, and higher wind speeds. Furthermore, warmer air above the oceans results in more water evaporating, making it even worse. So the extra water vapor then can lead to heavier downpours and subsequent flooding. It's pretty obvious. Warmer water also takes up more space. This along with melting land ice has caused global sea levels to rise, yielding storm surges that are higher and can move further inland than they otherwise did before. So this flooding occurred in Miami Beach, Florida on a sunny day with no rain. High tides now are regularly flooding the streets of Miami as well as other, as well as other several coastal cities around the world. This situation will only get worse as sea levels continue to rise. So part of Miami's problem is also that it's built on a limestone slab as the base of the city so it's totally absorbing all of the water like a sponge. <laughs> and that's another reason why they're having so many flooding issues. And I know they're currently working on their piping system, an underground system, to help try to um, eliminate that water out of the streets. So this is a picture of my parents. Uh, we had a huge snowfall here, you probably all remember. It was the winter of 2013-2014. So I'll never forget this day. It was on my mother's birthday, February 2nd. And I think we got, uh, I don't know, four feet of snow? I don't know. <laughs> I just knew I didn't have to go to work, so I was happy. But <laughs> this is an example of um, extreme precipitation and then the weather pattern stalling over us so that we just totally get onslaught with all the moisture. Mm -hmm. 
Miami is the number one city in, at, in risk in terms of assets. Other places include uh, Gangao in China, New York, New York, and others. Looking at cities at risk by population, we see that many huge cities in developing countries are very much in danger. In parts of these cities, as they become an uninhabitable, uninhabitable, where are these people going to go? Not to the U.S., right? Because we don't allow immigrants. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so uh, the biggest part of climate change, too, besides it affecting Chicago, is that it affects countries that are of lowest income, highest densities, poor people that have no control or any sort of means to do anything to help their situation. <laughs> Changing precipitation patterns can lead to droughts and water shortages. Southern Brazil, for example, suffered a devastating drought in 2015 and 2016. Just from what I've noticed in the news, I often do not see that some of these disastrous events happening in other countries, they're not even put into our news system. Uh, I happen to find out through other friends I might have in other countries. Um, I have some friends in Kenya where the elephants now no longer have water. They're used to certain rivers being flooded during the wet season. And now there are actually people that bring in trucks of water to help water the elephants. So, uh, so it's actually pretty sad because the uh, baby elephants uh, will die of having no water and the parents have to move on because they move on in a caravan. So they actually leave their babies behind. Higher temperatures also have a direct effect on the incidence and severity of wildfires. Here we see that the number of large fires corresponds closely to years with higher average spring and summer temperatures. Today the fire season in the western U.S. is more than 100 days longer than it was back in the 1970s. We're all seeing all those uh, fire videos now. Uh, I remember the one uh, recently with the guy saving the rabbits, so that kind of was cute, but <laughs> sad situation. So in 2016, this fire in the heart of the Canadian tar sands region destroyed large parts of the city of Fort McMurray, Alberta, and forced the evacuation of over 100,000 people. Wow. Once again, this stuff is like never in our news, hardly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, the number of climate-related extreme weather events has been going up worldwide. According to the insurance industry, which obviously they know the best because they're paying out the money. So, in 2016 alone, these disasters caused losses totaling over 175 billion USD. I don't know about you, but I do love uh, polar bears. This is a glacier in southwest Greenland. It had almost completely melted by 2013 due to rising temperatures. NASA has precisely measured the decline in the mass of ice in both Greenland and Antarctica. All this extra melting is obviously adding to sea levels worldwide. So this is Antarctica by helicopter. You can see that the ice is melting at a record pace without, obviously it's not reforming. So this slide should move, but it's not. But it demonstrates that this glacier, glacier in southwest Greenland is almost completely melted by 2013 due to rising temperatures. NASA has precisely measured the decline of the mass of ice in both Greenland and Antarctica. So this uh, picture runs viral recently. It's by Paul Nicklin. Uh, he's one of the people that I stalk on the internet. He's an awesome wildlife photographer. So while it is not scientifically feasible to prove that this polar bear is starving, um, and that it is starving due to climate change, 
The fact remains that the Canadian Arctic ice is melting and that this ice is crucial to the polar bears getting out to the ocean so that they can hunt for their, for their dinner of whales, seals, and other marine life. So they are landlocked, they can't get to their food, so they are stranded on land and and this is how they are, this is what happens. The Department of Defense in the United States has long warned about refugee crises connected to the climate crisis, as well as pandemic diseases, water shortages, and food shortages. So this can especially be seen in the Middle Eastern countries. We have a lot of um, people fleeing their countries in the Middle East, and a lot of it does have to do with the temperatures. Because once again, it's not in the news, but they've even had temperatures reported up to 124 degrees, which is basically uninhabitable, and there's no food production or anything in that kind of weather. Heat stress is now beginning to decrease crop yields from rice, corn, and soybeans. Exposure to high levels of carbon di dioxide in the atmosphere from our fossil fuels decreases the amount of nutrients that would be in our crops, such as the rice, rice wheat, and soy. So it's so intricately woven. Um, Tree repositories, uh, Amazon is the largest. So this is a photograph of the Amazon rainforest. According to the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification 2017 Global Land Outlook Reports, agriculture is by far the most important driver of water shortages around the world. Agriculture, almost entirely through irrigation, accounts for 70% of our global water usage. The remaining 30% is shared by the industrial and energy sectors, and only 10% is used by us, the general population. Groundwater accounts for up to a third of the global water usage. This is uh, supplying 2 billion people and over 40% of the irrigation water. The report goes on to project that two-thirds of the world's population will be living in water-stressed countries by 2025. So to me that seemed like a long time, but then wait a minute, it's 2018 already. So that's seven years. Almost less than seven years. So in the last century, water consumption increased six-fold, largely due to our agricultural use. According to a 2016 World Bank report, some regions could see their growth rates decline as much as 6% due of their gross domestic project, product by 2050 as a result of water-related shortages. And this will uh, send them into sustained negative growth. This is no reason to give up hope, though, because the same report projects that some regions stand to see growth accelerate as much as 6% if water sources are better managed. So this is just a slide of agriculture, which is everywhere. The extent of spring snow cover has continued to decrease in the northern hemisphere. In many regions, changing snowfall patterns and snowpack levels have me um, and the melt time have altered the hydrological system, affecting water quality and quantity. Look at all those cows. So as we know, cows are a big, um, also driver of the climate change and the uh, chemical recomposition of our atmosphere because of the methane, and then also because of the agriculture that is used to feed them. So this is an uh, organic farm in Whatcom County, County, Washington. So obviously organic is uh, low pest no pesticides, no herbicides, and they work on recycling their water uh, sustainability. The global food system is complex and shaped by many interrelated factors that are all touched by climate change. 
To start, as temperatures increase, the availability of water changes, and the composition of air changes too. We've already went over that. As a result, the crops that have evolved to succeed in the conditions of the last 10,000 years, they're no longer working. The three most prominent of these challenges for crops are heat stress, new pests, and expanded ranges for diseases. Crops have responded to these challenges, but in increasingly disastrous ways, often diminishing the nutrition they carry and increasing the toxins they accumulate in their grains. Food challenges don't end there. As global temperatures have increased, I missed a slide, I'm sorry. Food challenges don't end there. As global temperatures have increased due to climate change, the planet is now experiencing more and extreme hot days than any other time in human history. If the level of warming exceeds a crop's optimum temperature for extended periods, the yields will decline. More extreme temperatures over longer periods lead to droughts and hinder the transformation of the chemical composition in the plants, plants such as uh, nitrate utilization. And this can um, harm the animals that eat off of these plants then. In addition, warmer temperatures contribute to the poleward migration of many plants, but also to the pests that are plaguing them. Beyond expanding the range of pests, warmer temperatures also increase the reproduction and metabolism of insect herbivores, making these pests an even greater threat. For example, climate change has helped facilitate the spread of the Colorado potato beetle. This beetle is now inhabiting areas towards the North and South Poles, where they were once too cold to live in. So as relative humidity, air temperatures, precipitation, and weather patterns shift, just as the pests have expanded their range, so have diseases. This has allowed diseases to take root in locations closer to the poles and also in higher altitudes that have usually been too cold. So rising temperatures and more frequent extreme weather events decrease yields up to 23% by the 2050s. Plus our uh, population is growing, so how are all these mouths going to be fed? So how does climate change affect the food supply also is through pests. This is a photo of the Penny Pack Creek in Pennsylvania during the fall. Um, and it's showing that the um, pests, there's, well you can even see it here in Chicago that the, um, like the maple trees are getting a uh, fungus in them where their leaves get all these black spots. We've had so many uh, types of trees where you have to take them all down because the Japanese beetle or whatever is uh, decimating certain species. So the changes in the weather patterns, the water patterns, just like humans, when it's like cold outside, we say, don't go outside, you're gonna catch a cold. Uh, when the weather changes for the plants, they also, their immunity drops, so then they are more susceptible to these diseases that are taking out whole species. So, um, Asia's multi-billion dollar cassava industry is also at risk. I don't know if any of you eat that. I think that's um, related to the yucca plants. So finally, environmental stresses, such as those introduced by climate change, may trigger biophysical reactions in plants that can be harmful towards humans. So because the plants are stressed and uh, they can't function and manufacture their food and water correctly, 
then we're eating that and we're not getting the proper nutrients from those plants. It's basically to sum it up. Aphids and Japanese beetles were once uh, drawn to plants, raised in elevated CO2 conditions. Beetles that fed on the high CO2 leaves lived longer and laid more eggs. And the high CO2 levels also lowered the plant's natural defenses, making them helpless against these plant-eating pests. So yeah, a lot of bugs like the increased CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. <laughs> So we've already touched upon this, the nutrition of the plants is changing. Rising concentrations of CO2, carbon dioxide, are threatening global nutrition by reducing the levels of nutrients in food crops like rice, wheat, and soybeans. Zinc, iron, manganese, and calcium could decrease in these plants by 5 to 20 10 percent in stable crops as the CO2 levels rise. So we all know how important it is to take our vitamins and minerals and the best source of these is to get them from your food. But if our food will not have these in high amounts, then we could have certain diseases caused by not having those certain nutrients you know, iron deficiency anemia or things like that. Uh, not having uh, calcium magnesium can harm your bones. Also give you cramps. So toxins are accumulating inside the food supply. Higher temperatures and droughts can cause toxin accumulation inside the plants and because the livestock is eating these plants, threatening the health of humans and animals eating these. And on to disease. So wheat leaf rust, which thrives in higher temperatures and humidity, can lead to crop losses of up to 20 to 30 percent or more. Global systems vulnerable to climate. So this may lead to disruptions in political or societal, make us cause unstable. Global water use, 12% is used for domestic, 19% for industrial, and 69% for agriculture. So as temperatures rise, so does the water usage, which can affect people, crops, energy, industry, and animals. Water scarcity affects more than 40% of the world's population. Water scarcity then can have effect on the GDP. Countries that could lose up to 6% of GDP by 2050 under a business as usual scenario if we don't respond to climate change. So what are the major water repositories? Man-made reservoirs, lakes and rivers, groundwater aquifers, ice and snowpacks, and forests. Climate change is a reality, and we cannot depend on rainwater alone to fill our dams. So this is a uh, dam in Sierra State in Brazil. No water. I'm also concerned about Brazil because they just elected a new official that has very little concern for the environment. Infectious disease.
diseases, heat stress, air pollution, waterborne diseases are all influenced by a changing climate and it's not in our favor. It's actually a medical emergency. So this is a photo of wet red weed pollen through an electron microscope. So vector-borne diseases, heat stress, air pollution, waterborne diseases are all accelerating. So if CO2 emissions continue to increase, increase at their current rates, ragweed will produce 320% more pollen by the year 2100. So how many people here suffer from allergies or have family, friends that suffer from allergies? So, and I've noticed that even um, it's affecting our children and the younger po population even more. And I think that might have to do with our food supply and the environment that they're growing up in. Mortality from air pollution costs the U.S. 2.8% of its annual GDP. So this is a slide, air pollution. Um, obviously, I think we're all aware that China has a lot of air pollution and that they are wearing masks a lot of days on those pollution action days. And hopefully that doesn't become a reality in the United States. Climate change also increases the risk of many waterborne infectious diseases. So mosquitoes are one of the most prominent vectors for tropical diseases. Recent research suggests that under a worst case scenario involving continued high global emissions coupled with fast population growth, the number of people exposed to the principal Zika carrying mosquito known as the Aedes aegypti mosquito, could rise to as many as 8 to 9 billion by later in the century. So this mosquito, yeah, tropical disease is on the move. Warmer temperatures have impact on the spread of tropical diseases. Modern transportation and air travel also play a part. Uh, they can be innocent bystanders and travel with us. But also their range is expanding. So this is why they're able to then move and live in different places. So this is the mosquito that spreads the Zika virus. It also spreads dang and yellow, dengue and yellow fever. It's now covering a wider range in warmer, wetter worlds. In warmer temperatures, the virus incubates faster in the mosquito. The mosquitoes breed more, and they're able to transmit the disease longer. So this is why it's becoming uh, an issue. The health impacts of, climate, of the climate, climate crisis are often overlooked, but they will be affecting millions of people. So this slide is basically saying that the um, mosquitoes with the heat, they are actually reproducing at a rap more rapid rate and they mature more rapidly. So they're able to uh, have longer periods of transmitting the disease. So I know it's been in the uh, Caribbean and it's moving northward. I don't know that there's any reports in Florida, but I know that they are working to protect against it by doing GMO mosquitoes which I don't support. <laughs> GMO, <laughs> genetically modified. Genetically modified mosquitoes. This is just showing the acceleration of the um, life cycle of the mosquito and how it, it accelerates. You can see the dots are moving to the left by days.
so before the mosquitoes were actually maturing later and they were dying before they were actually able to transmit the disease. So that's why there are way fewer cases before. So we are now at risk of losing up to 50% of all land-based species in this century. Um, for example, with the frogs, um, with the changing climate, there is now a fungus that is decimating uh, most of the species of frogs, and they're actively working to find a way to screen the frogs to um, eliminate the transmission of the frogs. So there is a big frog trade industry for pets or food, and these frogs are coming into the country, and then they're spreading the disease to all the, like, the United States frogs. And um, I think at least 85% of frog species are susceptible to this virus, so um, we are losing a lot of frogs at very rapid rates. So once again, this is not the most recent information because we did just have an even worse red tide. Um, but these are strange events that occur when colonies of algae, which are simple plants, they live in the sea and freshwater. They grow out of control. And society, scientists prefer to call these events harmful algae blooms or HABs. These dense clusters of algae can be harmful to humans, other animals, and the environment. Some species of algae produce toxins which can kill fish, shellfish, um, and like we just have recently seen lots of dolphins, manatees, um, sea turtles, everything. They're ingesting this water and they are being all found on shore. So we have lost a lot of marine life off the Florida coast this year. So the change in ocean pH from 8.2 to now 8.1 is a significant change. We've all heard of ocean acidification. So this is happening because of the carbon dioxide that we are emitting from fossil fuels. The water absorbs the carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide then comes apart in the water and it recreates to become carbonic acid. So acid, we know, it changes the pH lower. So the pH is only a change of 0.1, but when you compare it on the scale, it's actually 25 to 30%. So I know from when my father was raising saltwater fish that we had to constantly measure the pH as it was vital to the survival of the fish. Uh, my dad raised saltwater fish for about 20 years, so we had 100 fish tanks and 5,500 fish at a time. So we were always doing chemistries to test our water for pH, nitrates, nitrates, all that good stuff. Populations of marine vertebrate, vertebrates are declining 49% based on from 1970 to 2012. Obviously, there are other factors coming into play, such as habitat destruction, human intervention, <coughs> but also because of the climate change with the acid water, it's altering the chemistry and the food supply of the ocean. So we also, because we do not live near the ocean, we have Lake Michigan, uh, we have a severity of invasive species. So when the invasive species come into the Lake Michigan, they can overpopulate and oust out our native species, thus again altering our water composition. So why is this possible? Um, invasive species tend to be, they're invasive because they are hardy. They have a genetics like we have genetics, and they are able to withstand more changes easily than some other species that are not able to change. Uh, when people change with their genetics, obviously, how long is it taken for us to evolve? So if conditions are changing rapidly, um, it takes a long time of generations of animals to keep up with those changes, so they end up dying.
So insects are declining at a rapid rate. So they are part of the bottom of the food chain. So when they are not around, other animals, such as uh, squirrels, birds, etc., they um, have no food. So invasive plants can, um, okay, so this is a monarch butterfly. And this is actually my baby. So I raised her and I released her. And um, monarch butterflies are having a hard time because of the milkweed, which is a native species of plant for Illinois. Uh, because of climate change, but also because of habitat and people, we are taking down the milkweed. So this is the only plant that the butterfly will actually land on and lay its eggs on and make babies. So if the milkweed is not present, then the monarchs cannot um, lay their eggs. So just my uh, word of advice, uh, when you are doing any kind of nursery uh, landscaping around your house, make sure that you are aware of what the native species are for Illinois. Uh, it's really easy to look up on the internet, or you could also email me. Uh, you cannot rely on nurseries, um, Home Depot, Menards, any of those places. Uh, they, they're not reliable for knowing, or even they sell a lot, a lot of non-native plants. So you have to be really uh, knowledgeable on your own. So all of these threats, including many that we haven't even covered here, and the fact that the World Econ Econ Economic Forum says climate change is the number one threat to the global economy. So does this help to answer the question, must we change? We have a choice to make. The answer to that first question, must we change, is yes. The scientific community has long told us, and Mother Nature is screaming at us right now, but will we change? We have to change. <laughs> but we fear of how to change, so that is a recipe for depression and anxiety. But the good news is that the, there is an answer to the question. The answer is yes. So obviously the answer is yes. So <laughs> I know it's obvious. So the answer is very exciting and uh, we do have the solutions at hand. So let's look at green energy progress. Wind energy has predicted to provide 30 gigawatts of electricity worldwide by 2010. As of 2016, we have exceeded that prediction by 16 times over. Okay, just hold this then. Let me uh, have to print it. So that's pretty exciting. U.S. wind energy capacity has gone up. Globally, wind could supply worldwide electricity consumption 40 times <laughs> over. The U.S. now has 84 gigawatts of wind energy installed, enough power to power 25 million homes. The general consensus of global wind power is enormous, and that's even using conservative estimates. For example, a 2009 study found that a network of land-based 2.5 megawatt wind turbines restricted to non-forested, ice-free, non-urban areas and operating as little as 20% of their rate could supply more than 40 times current worldwide electricity consumption and more than five times total globally use of energy in all forms. Even more dramatically than with wind, we see an exponential curve in the amount of solar energy installed around the world. Did Why did my thing go off? Did you? Oh, yeah, I think off. you better hit the button, the top it's one. Time out. Time. No energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The wind. Windmill stuff. You must have. Okay. You had a loss of slide. All right. Ready? 
So in many countries where there's no universal electricity grid, we are seeing consumers and businesses leapfrog over old technologies and installing these single solar panels in places that have long been denied of energy. So this is great for like lower income areas. Well, that was a boring slide anyway. <laughs> so this is India. China and India are both on track to overachieve their Paris commitments. At least China's doing good for some reason. In 2009, the Vatican decided to spend $660 million to build a 100 megawatt solar PV installation, enough to power nearly 40,000 homes. This plant was completed in 2010 and was Europe's first solar power station at the time. There's the Vatican. So I'm not sure why my slides aren't working. Every hour the Earth gets as much energy from the sun as we need to run the entire global economy for a year. <laughs> Maybe I'll come across a slide that works. Should. Okay. Oh, brothers. All right. I'm not sure what's happening. Oh, brothers. Global warming. <laughs> no. So, um, Volvo has announced that as of 2019, all of its new models will be electric or hybrids. So, General Motors believes that the future is all electric. In December of 2015, at the Paris climate negotiations, virtually every nation in the world agreed to phase down greenhouse gas pollution to net zero emissions as early in the second half of the century as possible. In addition to actions by countries, it is more important than ever that we all take the lead on climate. We are seeing corporations, states, providences, and cities committed to taking action to reduce emissions. So while the United States is wanting to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, we are taking it to the level of the grassroots where our local cities and businesses are now standing up to these Paris Agreements. It won't, it won't be but a second once this thing gets going. I, I, I don't know what happened, but we're going to have it have your slides up in a second. Huh. Overheated. <laughs> so Hawaii became the first state to commit to 100% renewables uh, for the entire state. Which state? Hawaii. Hawaii, yeah. They don't so uh, there has been a United States Climate Alliance formed, and there are 14 states involved in this. Uh, Illinois is not one of them, as you might think, but... Um, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware, Oregon, Vermont, Colorado. Which slide are you at now on, on the presentation? 108. 108. Come on. So we are still in 2,200 plus cities, nine states, 180 colleges and universities, 1,700 businesses and investors, all committed to the Paris Climate Agreement. So, and I think even since uh, I put this presentation together, that even more, um, there's even more involved. We don't have them on this presentation. Oh, no. So as we're aware, there are marches and demonstrations, uh, especially coming up with the ballot box coming up on Tuesday. Um, don't, um, don't, um, there is a great power in the people, 
So while it seems like we can't do much, together as a group, we do can create change. Hold on, Jim. Wait a minute, they're all coming. Oh, here they are, yeah. Just, okay, which one now? 108, yeah, so up there. Which one now? 108. You know, yeah, here. 110? Yeah. Okay, so it'll, 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 what happened was, is it just, uh, no, sometimes the computer bad. does not do that. You can go to slideshow. Wait, wait, wait. Go to slide. Sorry about this. Trump's the duration. We're all set now. Sorry about that. We should have your uh, Please. Yeah. 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 Hard drive error. So, like I said, we are still in on a local level. So U.S. cities committed to 100% renewable energy. This is a map of the U.S. showing the cities that have committed to 100% renewable energy or are, or are already there. It's actually um, not a lot, but um, not Chicago, yeah. but there are some. Yeah, not Chicago, but. So please join those who are speaking out and making choices to fight for the climate crisis. Use your voice, use your votes, and your choices in the marketplace and in your life. And then obviously speak out. So after the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. I want to share with you a line of poetry that has meant a great deal to me. This is speaking from Al Gore. So it was written by a poet. He was a businessman and a poet, Wallace Stevens. He wrote these lines. He said that after the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. All of the great social revolutions that have advanced the cause of humankind have met with an endless streams of no's. The civil rights resolution, anti-apartheid movement, women's rights and women's suffrage, the ab abolition movement before that, and more recently, the gay and lesbian rights movement. All of them met ferocious opposition, but ultimately, when the choice was refined to a single binary choice between what is right and what is wrong, and the moral imperative is clear, then the outcome becomes foreordained. I believe that is because of the way um, the universe has created us, or you might say it is because of human nature. And I believe we are right at that in the inflection point where the climate crisis is concerned. You can see from the evidence of what damage is being done that people all over the world are really suffering. We have to do this. And now you can see that since we don't, that we have the better tools and hopeful voices that we can change. I think we're crossing that tipping point. The only remaining question whether or not we have sufficient political will to win this time. But always remember that political will is in itself a renewable resource. Because our planet depends on it. Okay. So these are uh, two books that Al Gore does recommend. Uh, An Inconvenient Sequel and The Truth to Power. I believe these are also um, as films that you can watch. So this is my personal thing that I put together, things that you can start today. Uh, driving more fuel efficient cars or just driving less. I know sometimes I don't want to drive to the city because I don't want to spend the gas. Uh, unplugging uh, your electrical cords when you're not using them. I know it's kind of a pain in the butt sometimes to have to re-plug them in, but uh, their current will always be running if it's plugged in, even if you're not using it. Uh, like I mentioned, planting the native plants and removing non-natives. Using less heat or air conditioning, like using a um, electronic automatic thermometer for your heating system or cooling system so that the temperature changes while you're sleeping. Eating a plant-based diet because those cows are nasty and they create a lot of methane. Uh, unwanted, unused food comp composted or left outdoors to naturally decay. So uh, if you ever come to my house, you might find food scraps outside under a bush because I don't think composting is legal in Hoffman Estate, Schaumburg area, so I just throw my food scraps under the bush. 
So <laughs> it usually disappears pretty soon. So, uh, But when you actually throw it in the garbage, it does decompose, and then, then this creates heat, and it's just adding more methane and CO2 into the atmosphere. So um, generating less waste in general. Uh, this comes into play when you're buying products, uh, really looking at the packaging, bringing your own packaging. If you're using bulk foods, you can bring your own packaging. Um, when you're eating out um, at like a fast food restaurant, whatever, bring your own utensils, reusable bags, your cups, etc. If you're eating out at a restaurant, um, at least if you're a woman, you can have Tupperware in your purse. Uh, just to put your scraps in instead of taking home those styrofoam containers and plastic bags. Uh, just today I was in Schaumburg driving and there was a uh, falcon flying and it actually had a plastic bag hooked onto its foot. And so I was watching it fly with the bag and I was following it <laughs> because I thought maybe I could try to take the bag off, but obviously not. But um, going plastic free. So. Um, <laughs> Know your organization's stores and products. So if they're not in compliance with sustainability, then don't support them. And then obviously reach out with your voice via phone, email, uh, the internet, all of that. Uh, manufacturers, organizations requesting change. Uh, I have myself have come up with scripts letters that I can send out to companies requesting changes. So. Uh, to be honest, I've never heard back from them, but I, at least I feel better that I've sunted and I've stayed in my voice. So thank you. Um, and once again, I'm from the Climate Reality Chicago chapter, and you're all welcome to join. Uh, we can take your name at the end and add you to the email list. And then um, um, I have business cards if you guys need to contact me later, so I can pass those out. Or find me on Facebook. Okay, I guess it's time for questions. I'd like to grant the first one. Can you tell us a little bit about your backstory about how you got involved with all this in the first place? Um, so I just, I guess part of it too is because I'm an only child and then, um, so, you know, you don't have a lot of things to do during the day when you're younger, so I spent a lot of time in nature. Uh, we had a lot of animals as pets, and then from the travels that we did, my parents are very into animals and nature, so this really fostered my almost dependence upon them to really soothe my soul, so I want to do anything and everything I can to save them, so. Have you been to the Crabtree Nature Preserve, too? Yeah, a long time ago. Because I know that's right where Hoffman Estates is at. Um, I think it's a different part of Hoffman Estates. So I haven't been there recently. Okay, just curious. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. There's so much good, good material. I was wondering if this this presentation has somehow been sort of condensed for politicians, so that we could, uh, you know, invite key politicians to look at it with us. Yeah, there's many different versions. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, there is a 10-minute version. There's 30-minute version. This was just my own version I put together. And also more, something that, that would focus more on the diseases we suffer, uh, you know, that, that would be a very moving thing. And also someone that would collect stories of people that have been hurt by the environment, because that's very powerful to share a call. Next question? Out there. Um, You're next. Sir. Over here. Uh, have you ever had, I've seen uh, politicians and conservatives react violently to these kind of arguments. Have you ever personally received uh, very, very aggressive uh, reactions to your presentation. Uh, not yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I understand you could use um, hydro planting in order to save water. Mm -hmm. So how much food could you really grow? Is it enough to feed the uh, seven plus billion people that we have? Um, well, uh, I know they're putting the hydroponic plants on buildings. Um, some places, countries, cities, they're actually building uh, the rooftops with the hydroponic plants. And then also uh, homesteads, people, families can also have the hydroponic plants at home. Could you uh, flip the projector to black in the screen? Cop. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
I just a question. Are you are you married? Do you have kids? No. Okay. I, what I'm wondering about is, and I assume at some point maybe you want to get married and have kids. Um, just more some of those kids may live in the 21st century. Do you think they're going to make it? Do you think our, 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 our climate is going to make it this far? So we're going to live. Uh, we have to take drastic change now um, in, order to, in order to keep it. Uh, there will be changes that will be uh, life changing that our kids will, probably won't, will definitely probably not see polar bears from penguins and a lot of these other larger species that uh, tigers, lions, and bears, those kinds of things. So they're going to die out uh, either from climate change or from habitat destruction, and from especially the third world country is. Expanding. Could, could you explain how a half a degree centigrade can have such a big effect on global warming? warming? Well, okay, so I, um, like I mentioned, my father raised the saltwater fish. And when we, um, so the fish would lay the eggs inside a flower pot, and those eggs would. Um, incubates for like 14 days and we would measure the uh, temperature of the water every day and if those tanks if the heater uh, broke or was malfunctioning we found that our tank was even a half a degree hotter those fish actually hatched a whole day earlier so we ended up losing those babies because uh, we were not aware that they would be hatching a day earlier so just from that example uh, I mean, that's a whole 24-hour difference in an egg hatching uh, from one simple life system. So I would imagine that all life systems would be affected by even half a degree. We're losing a coral reef around the world, so we're just a little ocean temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Charlie in the back. Yeah, Natalie, I noticed you, you recorded a number of events that took place in nature, and then somehow you automatically went home and sat down and started explaining how those events took place. And are you, know, you certain there's causality or maybe that's just a correlation? I mean, is there a certitude on any of this? Uh, which point are you referring to? Well, you, you say you gave all these events. Name one. Which specific event would you like Hurricanes. to point to? What? Uh, the change in the, the, what is it, the currents? Forest fires? Yeah. Well, there is demonstration that with the changing uh, jet stream and how it's becoming more wavier, that the patterns of weather are stagnating. So we have just seen this through um, experience, basically. Um, measuring the jet streams and then experiencing the delayed weather patterns. So as for the hurricanes, um, it's kind of basic chemistry that when um, it gets warmer that more water will evaporate. So that creates more water coming down because whatever goes up does come down just by the law of gravity. Yeah. Natalie, what would you say to those um, corporatists uh, that um, just flat out um, don't accept any of these facts that you presented and they're, you know, simply convinced of uh, the errors in their ways? I don't really see that uh, they would be, that I would be able to convince them, but there are, is a large, uh, large majority in the middle that aren't sure about climate change. So those would be the uh, people that are more likely to want to try to influence so that we can create more people that are wanting to work to um, remediate the climate change. Yeah. So I would not waste my time and energy on trying to convince somebody that was very strongly against it. <laughs> Dennis, now the excellent presentation. I testified at the US APA hearing here in Chicago uh -huh. about uh, Trump's uh, dirty power plan. I stuck around and heard the uh, representative from the Harlan Institute uh, testify. He said most Americans don't favor any action on climate. Trump uh, campaigned on getting rid of Obama's clean power plan, and he won. And environmentalists, he said, they say, he said, 
why they they're, they're, they make up 90% of all the people at these hearings, but we don't represent the majority of Americans. Uh, what would you say to that? Um, I know that um, as climate reality leaders that we were actively uh, recruiting people to go to these EPA hearings and I think that there's just not enough people that are aware of them so that they can re represent our voice. So it becomes a matter of becoming um, uh, spreading the word if you, if you were to hear about the EPA hearings to help invite those people. But aren't there polls that show that the majority of Americans do support the Clean Power Plan? Yes, from what I've read. Yeah, I got one too. That in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. okay. well, urgent mm -hmm. question. For, next, uh, for the election coming up, I know in general that the Democrats have a better record on the environment than the Republicans, but is there any particular race you think we should be financing or helping in a very close race between, you know, pro or against the environment? Um, right now there is a bill in Washington, D.C. called Bill 1631, and it is for carbon taxing. So this bill will state that um, corporations will have to pay $15 per metric ton of CO2 that they're emitting. And so we're trying to promote, even though we're not in Washington, D.C., you can still promote it and uh, create awareness around it. Because uh, obviously a lot of people are aware of all, every bill that's on their voting uh, when they get there. And if Washington, D.C. passes this bill, 1631, yeah that they will um, become leaders in our country on setting the one of the first tax taxes on carbon. So hopefully they'll be role models for other states. What do you think of fracking? Uh, I think very negatively of fracking. So it's basically shattering the earth beneath the ground and it's very dangerous and laid off. But you're getting natural gas. But it's also um, the fluid that is going through the pipes and fracking is very corrosive to the pipes that are underneath the ground. So those pipes are corroding and they eventually are leaking and bursting, releasing all that toxin into our ground, which then affects our water supply and plant life and everything. Over here. Uh, oh, well, fracking, <clears throat> fracking causes a lot of methane leakage. Right. And uh, that's another major problem with it, that um, there's so much methane is, and then there's always the fl flare up. But this is not a question, I apologize. Okay. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Just where do you stand on nuclear power? Um, I'm not for it. Um, it's not one of the uh, most favorable energy. Um, it's better than the fossil fuels, but I would definitely be against uh, putting up more nuclear plants. Uh, the waste is, uh, there's nowhere to put the waste. Yeah, um, I guess I wanted, uh, well, a couple, one little question is, was your father a scientist? Is that why he did that? Or, or is that a hobby? Or uh, It was a hobby, but he also had scientific tendencies. So I did, uh, prior to this presentation, I got my dad's climate change uh, Excel spreadsheet since 2009 for every month of the year. So I did not put it into a slide, but he has measured the temperature of Hoffman Estates for 11 years every day. But yeah, he's a scientist. He, even when we had the fish things, he would count every dead fish. So, and then that all went on an Excel spreadsheet. So. <laughs> this is a hobby, not like a professor or, uh, or something. No, my dad was a uh, quality control manager at Motorola. So, and then he had the fish business on the side, and then it eventually became his full-time business. Yeah. Out here. Right, yeah. Okay, right Watch over there. Okay. Ellen. Um, I'm wondering, do you know, um, like, states like California that are trying to move ahead um, with yeah. a smaller carbon footprint, do you know whether the Trump administration is fighting that, in some of the measures? Well, um, I mean, Trump can only fight it from the, um, you know, the national level, but um, I don't think he can really have too much of an influence over the state and cities. Um, I think they're going to do what they want to do. Because I know that, I think, like, Bush or something was trying to fight it and trying to say you can't have these higher emissions for cars or whatever. Well, I know Trump is trying to do that, but I don't know if he'll be successful. So... 
Uh, what do you see in terms of uh, initiatives on this in Illinois? From climate change in Illinois? Yes. Um, well, I believe that we are seeing, um, you know, longer uh, summers, you know, starting in the spring, it gets warmer quicker in the year, and then the falls are more extended. Um, we're seeing the downpours of rain. I know in Schaumburg last year we had um, a huge downpour and flooding in Schaumburg and microbursting events that I've never seen since I've been here. Um, and then also I see a lot of loss of native species of uh, animals that I used to enjoy watching when I was a child and now there's very few of them. So those are just a few examples locally that I've seen. Okay. Bob. Um, Nellie's my uh, beautiful niece and she gave an excellent talk, very <clears throat> knowledgeable and activist, but I'd like to ask her of all the uh, points that you mentioned about what I can do as an individual, um, which one do you most recommend? Getting a fuel efficient car? Um, I'd be more concerned about my daily life, uh, working on decreasing my plastic and um, eliminating my food waste, um, decreasing my energy usage is a big one, uh, taking down my heat and um, putting the air conditioning down lower. Um, you know, I usually, sometimes in the winter I put the heat down, is down to um, 60 or 65 and then I just stay in a room with a little space heater so that I'm just heating my room. Yeah. Um, I also do a lot of recycling, so I got the recycling started at my uh, work facility. So, uh, you know, there's little things you can do at the companies that you uh, are affiliated with or any kind of organizations you're affiliated with. If they're not doing sustainable actions, you can help initiate that change at the local level. Charlie? Okay. Yeah. All right. Natalie, it, yeah, I'm a, on any given day, <laughs> I get a couple emails from lefty groups that there's some emergency or crisis. That I either have to sign a petition or make a contribution. And we've had any number of speakers here at the college warning us with dire warning of the consequences. Why, what would separate your message from theirs? You mean using the uh, petitions and stuff? Yeah, the, the crisis. General. Um, I mean, petitions do work. I've seen that the petitions can work for certain um, conditions that come up, such as the elephant ivory in China. There's been a lot of public uh, pressure on China to not have the ivory come into their country. So in that way, I do see that petitions do work. Uh, do I sign petitions? I I am selected in which ones I sign, but I do sign them because I do believe that they have an effect. Okay. Okay, uh, we're gonna go to rebuttals here pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, one last question and then. Uh, I just wonder if you've ever heard of the company Collective Resource. Because I haven't. It's a, a company that will come around to your house and pick up your food scraps and uh, they give you a five gallon bucket and uh, they come around and pick up your stuff. And I use them. Uh, it's, it's kind of expensive, but it's worth it because then okay. you don't have to throw out. All right. That's that collective cost. resource? Collective resource. How do you locate them? Uh, you, you know, I think I've got the telephone number on my phone. Well, tell us about it when you come up for rebuttal. Right. Okay. 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 All right. Give our speaker a hand, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, I made that mouse. One quick note for yeah, watch yourself. Found, uh, oh, it's going to be a timer car going up. Back there, uh, the car key and a couple of house keys. Uh, I'm not, there might be a Ford. Mm. Who's, did anybody lose these keys? They were back there on the literature table. <laughs> So uh, if, if anybody figures out that they, they left their keys, look in your pocket and purse because we, we got an extra set of car keys here tonight. Okay, uh, who wants to give a rebuttal tonight? Uh, get your hands up and keep them up so I can get a count. One, two, 
<laughs> three, he's first, four, five, oh, six. Okay. Anybody on this side for a rebuttal? Yes. Tim? Right. Alan, eight, six, seven, eight, nine. And then me is ten. Charlie, you're going to give a rebuttal or you're going to stay silent tonight? Talk, no, we're talking. <laughs> okay, that's 11. Uh, go with our usual three minutes tonight. Uh, actually, we can probably do four. Yeah, we'll have 11 people. Take away Let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Thank our speaker again for a great presentation. Uh, make a concise rebuttal as you can because we're going we're to have 11 or 12 people on rebuttals. So, uh, come on up. Uh, your first set. Yeah, How much time? Uh, these, well, three minutes. Once we get a timer up. Yeah, these uh, issues like global warming not only has an effect is um, an effect on everybody, but it's also political and economic. And we see uh, two countries so far. She pointed out some other countries that are developing solar panels but mostly in Germany and in China. And the last thing I heard about uh, Germany was they're going back to coal to a considerable degree. So we have to isolate one country, actually, and that's China. China it produces more solar panels than any other country, every other, every country in the world combined. And they plan to double that within a five or ten year period. Why is it that China is leading? Because it's a socialist country, and the socialist country, what happens, they put people before profits. In the capitalist country, they put profits before people. And the capitalists look at raw materials not as something that is uh, good for human beings, but how to make a profit off of it. And they don't care exactly what happens to the environment. They think raw materials are just endless, and we can keep living like we're living forever. But you've got limited resources on the planet, and you have to recognize that, and they don't recognize that at all. So we really got a problem because we have corporations, especially the fossil fuel corporations, that make tremendous profit off of oil and gas and things that have nature. And they're not going to give it up just because somebody tells them it's bad for the environment because they, they get all kinds of rationales to, to show that it's not harming the environment. But that is so, uh, so much lies attached to that because if you look at any season of the year now, we got these drastic floods, and in the winter time, we got snows 25, 30 inches high, and this is really extreme. So we have to do something about it with very, uh, in a very short span of time, because the climate scientists have said we got another anywhere from 12 to maybe 20 years okay. to uh, right. do something about it. Otherwise, what's going to happen? you're going to reach a qualitative point or a tipping point where we can't go back to okay. what we have now or what we had before. So we have to take that into consideration okay. right. that the capitalist countries are only interested in profit. Thank you. Okay, next. This is the book, Throw Down. Drawdown. Uh, I'll give you a summary of this. Um, this is a Paul Hawken brought this in 2016. So it's, this is fairly new stuff. Uh, basically, he says uh, there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, there's a, a list in the back of the book. There's 15, 20. There's many, many things you can do. You know, one of them is. Family planning, refrigerant management. Is all, what the hell is all this stuff? It all fits in. All I can say is what you've mentioned here, uh, for the most part, politicians, especially the ones that are in office now, aren't dealing with it. We're not, they're not dealing with it at all. Uh, case in point, 
these lights right here, on a national level, most of the electricity comes, uh, well, 30% of our electricity still comes from coal. Now, that's changed. It used to be a majority. Now it's 30%. 33% comes from natural gas. So this is this is shifting. Uh, I'll just mention a couple other things. Volkswagen used to have a diesel car. They've gotten rid of it. Uh, they're, they're basically going to electric. You know, all, all, all the big manufacturers are going to electric. It's happened. It costs a bit more, but this, this is happening. So we're in transition now. My only question is, uh, I'm not going to be around because I've, I've got a few more years to live. You still have the, uh, uh, families to grow and stuff like that. So at the end of the century, I don't know if we're going to be around. Uh, our civilization is going to be around like it is. I'll just mention another thing. Um, all along the East Coast, New York, Boston, Baltimore, uh, anything along the East Coast, Climate's rising. The seas are rising. When's the last time you took a look at the property values in Miami? You see any changes? No, nothing. That's all going to change. We're going to be living in a different world. Anyway, this is the book, Draw Down by Paul Hawking, and you can have a copy of this. Uh, anyway, so I've got to, I'm going to be I'm going to be around a couple more years. That's it. But you you've got the rest of your life to live. All right. I think the biggest the biggest threat with climate change is uh, the fact that um, it's going to displace so many people. You have s such a huge percentage of the world's population that lives in cities that have been around for since shipping was the only mode of transportation in the world. They're all on the coast. You have huge cities that eventually are going to be forced, all these populations are going to have to move, which means that there is going to be an insanely unaffordable uh, cost for uh, a need for new infrastructure that's not going to be able to be met. And in, as an example of this, uh, in, just this week in the paper, I read how Rom was suppressing the fact that there are about 250,000 homes that need new, uh, or replace their lead water pipes. It's like 10 to 30 feet of water pipe, but they're estimating 5,000 bucks a home. That's over a million bucks. And that's just for the water pipes, supplying houses. So if you have this mass dis world displacement, you're going to create all these uh, economic uh, pressures, the social pressures, the environmental pressures, and political pressures, and foment a huge opportunity for uh, very bad characters to come in and take over politically for these unstable countries. So I think that that's a huge threat for people uh, a generation or two down the road. Uh, there's also one thing that I would respectfully uh, uh, disagree with uh, with the presenter, and um, there were a couple of points where they, where you were uh, talking about saving the planet. I've heard this a lot before. I really think it's a really bad phrase. The planet's not going anywhere, and, and the problem with that phrase is that if you're trying to win the hearts and minds of people who are on the border or, or against you, using a phrase that doesn't make any sense is just going to get. A, a dismissal from them. It, it reminds me of in the 30s they used to tell people don't smoke pot because you'll become a, a crazed maniac killer and all it elicited was laughter from people who smoked pot. Um, and in the 50s and the 60s, oh it, it's a, it'll lead you to heroin. It's, it, it's, a, it's a bad argument and um, and I really think that uh, a better argument would be to, you know, save your grandkids, because that's the threat. The mountains and the oceans and uh, the plains, they don't care about people. The Earth's been around for billions of years. People have been around for 100,000 years. The Earth doesn't care if people go extinct. So I would respectfully suggest that that phrase be changed. Thanks.
Uh, my name is Dennis Nelson. I'm a naturalist, an energy environmental researcher, writer, speaker, organizer. I'm a member of the Nuclear Energy Information Service. I get the um, Climate Reality Projects um, emails, and this is an action alert that I, that I signed online Wednesday, August 22nd of this year. I am the climate majority. I support climate action. The president doesn't speak for us on climate. We are the climate majority. We're the seven out of 10 Americans who see our climate changing and want our government to act, who want to, to power our country with clean energy, not dirty fossil fuels. We're everywhere from rural red state towns to big blue city cities, blue state cities. We're the Republicans who believe kids should breathe clean air, and the Democrats who know that free enterprise can build dreams without destroying the earth. Angry voices want to divide us, but with the climate changing, we're coming together because our planet and our families matter more than party politics. We refuse to let politicians risk our future and our world just so fossil fuel companies profit. Americans care about the economy. Americans care about national security. Americans care about our climate. Now we let our leaders know. I'm going to read as much as I can excerpts from my testimony at the US EPA hearing Monday, October 1st of this year at the Ralph Metcalf Federal Building in the Chicago South Loop. My testimony is entitled, Please Make the Clean Power Plant Tougher and Keep It Intact and On Track. Immediately Dump the Phony Dirty Power Plant. I submitted comments in favor of the original Clean Power Plant. This would, this would have reduced carbon pollution from inherently dirtier coal-fired power plants roughly 32% by 2030. The Clean Power Plan also would have prevented about 90,000 asthma attacks annually and avoided around 2,000, 3,200 premature deaths each year during that same time period. Even after the cost of compliance are considered, the Clean Power Plan would have still provided up to $45 billion in net climate protection and public health benefits every year. There is a snowball and hell chance, in other words, no chance whatsoever, of the uh, Trump-Pence administration and the right-wing Republican-controlled Congress passing some sort of price on carbon pollution, whether a carbon tax, a cap and dividend, or a combination of the two. Therefore, as a result of the regulatory authority granted by the historic U.S. Supreme Court decision under the Clean Air Act, the Clean Power Plan would have been the essential no. regulatory driver for the rapid expansion of fossil fuel-free and nuclear-free options energy efficiency, co-generation, and appropriate renewables. The mission of the U.S. EPA is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, not the U.S. Polluter Protection Agency. Thank you. Next, please. Go ahead. It's three minutes. Hi, I'm a researcher, and I've been researching the best way to get what we want. And there's a page in the back, you can get that page about what I found. But the most important thing I think we need to do is get the stories of people that are suffering right now from climate disaster. I would call it disaster. Climate disaster. For example, here's what I told the EPA. There's a study, and it's one of only some, many studies, that shows that women exposed, older women exposed to air pollution, increased their chances of dementia by 92%. Now, statistics is not the most powerful argument, but it, it, it should get people's attention. We all don't want anybody, and at different ages suffer too. But it's very important, I think, to remember that this is, makes people sick and demented. In fact, one study found, actually a lot of different specialists found that they see a strong link between air pollution exposure and Alzheimer's. But to be effective, we can't just scare people. There's got to be a solution. And that's why I'm glad you brought up the whole question of the wind power. That is so powerful and so clean. It's wonderful. So that's what, you know, I, what I'd like to do is to, with you, we can, you got my information. It's on the back page there of my email. But let's share information about people we know are suffering. And, and if we can take those people to our politicians, that's the most effective thing that they can hear. They can see a person. They can't turn away and say, that, you're not suffering that. You're not really getting that trouble, are you? No, they can't dare say that. 
they, we won't convince them all, but there's enough out there we can. And by the way, if you know anybody that thinks that Rahner is the best choice, I've got some pages in the back that show Rahner wants to delay dealing with the, co the coal companies. C coal companies. Mm -hmm. Just think of that. I mean, wh wh where's his head? I mean, I don't know. But money. Okay, money, money. money. Yeah, okay. So those are some things. And I'd, like, I'd like to join with you and, and let's make a partnership and share stories. Every time I go to a doctor these days, I say, I want health care for all. Please send anybody to me that has a problem with health care and they can't afford it. And I'll take them to Durban and Duckworth and whoever else yeah. needs to go to. So that's the kind of thing I think we could do together. My name is Mike Brennan and I, I, I'm a, a, a former doctoral program student and I've done community organizing since 1991 in Chicago and I've got results, not always. But anyway, I know what to do. You know, let's work together and we will make a difference. As long as that we focus on the things that bother people the most and that we have a solution for them. Is there any questions? Do you have time for a question? How, how does Durban help or Duckworth help? What do you, you take okay. them? Oh, that's a good question because right, I, here's another important thing to do. The League, I think it's the League of Conservation Board is okay. holding record of all the cat people in Congress. They do, right. They're good on all right, it. Right? Let's move on to our next speaker, please. We have another speaker. We got another yeah, speaker. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. Okay, hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, uh, so Linda and I, we took a ride out with some friends to uh, near western Illinois, somewhere between here and Rockford, I believe. I was amazed, we were both amazed at all of the wind turbines that were installed and the ones that were going up. Huge, huge installation. Um, and what they told us about it was, um, the people who drove us down there, was that there was a symbiotic relation between the farmers renting the land and the turbines producing the electricity, that it gave the farmers a, a nice base income that they were able to use to, uh, you know, to ride through the, uh, what's going on, with what always happens with farming. So the thing about um, the environment, and carbon footprint, which is what, how I sum it up, is um, carbon footprint, a proxy for me is how much money you spend, okay? Carbon footprint, the money you spend is directly related to the cost of the, to the product cost, which is directly related to its carbon footprint, all right? Whatever it takes to build it, to ship it, to package it, to move it, to put it on a store, to put it on a shelf, to have lights when you buy it. Everything that has to do is built into the price. Okay? So just save money. You're going to need it later anyway. All right? So if you want to do something that you can do as an individual, spend the least amount of money you can. Go to Goodwill, buy used clothes, don't buy new clothes. Okay? Spend the least amount you can. And that directly translates into how big a carbon footprint you're going to cast. Right? And casting the smallest carbon footprint does two things. One, puts money in the bank for you. Two, it helps the environment. Three, it gets a message that these that businesses clearly understand. Because they are not making money. It's not that they're losing money. They're just not making money. Okay? So what you do is you talk to them in a language that they understand, and then they'll listen to you. And you do, and if we all do this, they'll listen very quickly. Thank you. Okay, next, please. freshman in Evanston Township High School back in early 1970. We had the first uh, Earth Day teach-in. And Dr. Roger Charlier, who taught at that time at Northeastern Illinois, spoke to us. And Dr. Charlier said, and I quote, that mankind is going to end not with a bang or with a whimper, but with a gas. And unfortunately, I don't know that we've made that much progress since 1970. I'd like to think that we have in some respects. 
but much more needs to be done. And I want to thank you for your excellent presentation on that, on that subject. Um, Commonwealth Edison, in regard to nuclear power, Commonwealth Edison, when I was a boy, was busy building the Zion nuclear plant and promising us years and years of cheap electricity. And they even had that cartoon character that some of you will remember, the bird with the light bulb face, uh, little Bill, uh, telling us, little Bill. Well, it's not so little now. Finally, with regard to the idea that Bruce Rauner is busy trying to make money for his friends, well, all of you know the old saying, money talks and bullshit walks. Okay, next. Three minutes. Hi, Hi my name is Ellen Corley, and um, thank you. That was wonderful. It really was very helpful. Um, and uh, I like the comments also. Um, you know, thank you, Mike Brennan, uh, for your insights about, you know, I'm always looking for organizing ideas. I've kind of come to this late in life. Um, and I'm kind of a pessimist because my I was raised by a stepfather who was really a denier. He was really a right in there with the people who financed Trump, and um, I didn't really realize it. But uh, you know, and I, it just got normal denying climate change. I, I realized every single policy. He, he was the chairman of the Manhattan Institute, and they pay people to write you know, that climate change isn't real, they uh, pay people to talk about cops, you know, um, you know, that racial profiling isn't a concern, uh, so denial is a, it's a real thing for them, and it's really, frankly, fascist. Um, and so my best idea is uh, regulation. I'm thinking now, um, really, that we need right regulation, scientific right regulation. I want to give a talk, write a book, um, because what they've done is taken deregulation and deregulated everything, and it, it just is insane. Um, and it, it's willful, and billions and trillions of dollars are spent on it, and I, I, I get discouraged with the idea that, um, you know, just, uh, you know, one person keeping their heater down is going to change things because uh, they're at war. And, um, you know, just like the capitalist, late stage capitalism and fascism is warring on, you know, uh, that's what they are doing. And they, they come right from, right from uh, the same people that financed Hitler or doing the same thing to us. They're, they're, it's a war on liberals. It's a war on, you know, ever, democracy um, and it is a, they're they're putting all our trillions to do it to us and it it's it's really scary but we I want to really regulate the media and science because I mean everybody really can admit that it's a war on science um, and scientific thinking and it I you know Charlie asked about to me it's there's a theory Darwin had a theory and we check the facts. I like, you know, climate change, if it's a theory, all these, your facts, great presentation, <laughs> confirm it. Um, and the same thing with the media. The media is deceptive, yeah. and um, the facts up. support yeah. it if we prove it. Okay. Deceptive media. Mm -hmm. Next. You guys have been taking it. Yeah, I just am blown away by how well researched this talk was, and uh, I really thank Natalie for doing this. Uh, um, I'd like to, uh, I just wish that all of these people that are climate uh, change deniers could uh, uh, be forced, you know, like in the movies where they, um, you know, they put you in a chair and they, you know, make sure your eyes are open and they force you to watch something. Okay. Usually it's done for torture, but in this case it's done for education. Um, yeah, uh, I second uh, uh, some of the things people said. I, I really would love to go through this talk again, and I'm glad it's being videoed so that it's possible to do so. And um, I, I think, though, that the trouble is, I mean, we have so many, we have all these facts on our side, and yet um, 
we don't we don't seem to be able to uh, break through the uh, the passion problem where um, our opponents uh, uh, seem to have the enthusiasm um, you know of, of ignorance and stupidity in some cases, but uh, uh, but we need to, to try to encapsulate um, these problems in a, a, a really focused message and more and more uh, catchphrases and more uh, slogans that can that can um, get through. Um, we do, however, start out with the majority, and whenever you talk about Trump winning the election, it was all because of the Electoral College, that should be pointed out again and again. And uh, um, although uh, earlier uh, when I made, when I was in the announcements, I said uh, nobody should vote green, um, I'll, I'll amend that and say, well, you can for very, you know, lower parts of the ballot, where especially if it's for trying to get a ballot access, because the ballot access laws are so rotten. Now, I want to re-emphasize, um, because I am with Refuse Fascism, that um, in the name of humanity, and of course, uh, this uh, topic um, is um, both for humanity and both for the United States. The United States is going to be and is already being hurt by uh, these disastrous consequences of the global warming. And uh, so, again, there's a protest. Um, sponsored and called for by Refuse Fascism um, because we know the election, uh, regardless of its blue wave, uh, is going to still result in Trump and Pence in power and the Republicans who are pretty toxic, especially on this issue of global warming. Um, so also uh, November 10th, Saturday, which more people can probably attend uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. Both of those protests are in Federal Plaza. The protests begins at 4, there's a press conference at 5, uh, supposed to go from 4 to 7 on the day after the election. I don't know if everybody will be there all that okay. time. Now one thing, just give me a, just give me a very short amount of time here. Uh, in order to uh, increase passion on our side, um, someone has uh, done uh, new lyrics to the national anthem. Uh, your, the time's stanzas, up. your time's I, up. Just, <laughs> your time's up. Let me sing this. You know because your time's up. It. We got other speakers. I thought I had five minutes. We got other speakers. No, it was three. Everybody short today. Sorry. Uh, it's actually done. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, next. Three minutes only, so don't accelerate the clock with me. We just started the clock. You can see it. It's, it's up to me to, uh, after all these comments, uh, tackle the controversial part of the subject. Uh, one of the things, uh, how many of you have heard my rebuttal on methane? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. Anybody took notes? I think our speaker has covered it briefly there, changed to vegetarian diet, cut down on methane, right? There you are, prove my point. Uh, that's only one part of the controversy. Considering the religious people, and that's a controversy there, remember, they will, they will tell you God said, go and reproduce yourself. Yeah. God gave us good. He forgot to say when to stop. We can, pro we can produce kids, but we cannot produce land to feed them. And how many of the speakers here kept that in mind? And uh, that's the problem. Uh, it really is the problem because overpopulation is one of the causes for climate change. You might deny it. I guess you might, your denial be as strong as your desires.
My time is almost up, so anyways, but think about it. Um, if we're going to tax CO2, I think we sooner or later we'll have to tax reproduction, don't you think? I mean, come on, use restrain people. That's the best climate change there is. You can't restrain that. Thank you. After all, anybody can reproduce themselves, even an amoeba does. And the first thing that our speaker said, how many have you grandkids? Oh my, how can we hold it back, right? <laughs> That's my point. Thank you. All right, you guys got the clock ready there now? Hit the eclair. Just go to six. Yeah, just just go to six. Okay. Right, and start it. All right, you know, as much as I'd like to counter our speaker's arguments on the affordability of climate change. The thing is, I can't. And frankly, I agree with our speaker tonight about the immediacy of climate change and about the present day nuclear reactors that we have that are not an acceptable solution for power. The thing is, I, in my own concern about climate change, I learned about something that would be a potential solution to climate change. And that is we need power. We need a replaceable power source that won't take up a lot of resources. And that, my friends, I know you think I'm crazy and you think I'm mad, but I still think the development of the thorium molten salt nuclear reactor would be the best way to combat global climate change. We could have these things out and about in less than 20 years. We could. And we can also, at the same time, when you really look at it, it's a safer form of nuclear power that doesn't require a pressure vessel, and it doesn't require a lot of these safety features built in because you're trying to sustain a reaction rather than do it, throw it down. I could get into much more of the technical, re of the technical reasons why, but an organization called the Thorium Energy Alliance out of Harvard, Illinois, with John Kutch is their director has a lot of the advantages and the technical breakdowns of the thorium molten salt reactor. With the widespread deployment of these reactors, we wouldn't need to go scale up these thousands and thousands of wind turbines that are needed to take up the steel and the metals and the things. Remember, all of that has to be made in large scale industrial plants. And there is about a 12 year payback on the solar and wind when it comes in. Plus, when the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, you're gonna back it up with natural gas. And when you, ex everybody knows that cars get less mileage when they're sped up and slowed down in traffic. The same thing happens in a natural gas plant, and you're actually emitting more CO2 and carbon when a plant is ran like that in conjunction with solar. All I'm gonna say is this. If you think I'm mad, then go out and prove me wrong. I want all of you to, if you can, take Google Thorium Nuclear Power. Take a look at some of the videos out there done by a person by the name of his, uh, Gordon McDonald. Take a look at some of the studies that have been done. I have gotten so excited in this field that I've attended three of the Thorium Energy Alliance conferences myself. And if you don't think that this will be a solution to our climate change problem, I will debate you anytime, anywhere. I'll take care. Already have. All right, Charlie. Maybe we can schedule it in January. Already have. Already we'll schedule it in January, Charlie. Kim, Kim, we've already done that. All right. Let's say, can speaker, thank you very much, family. That was very good and very thorough there. I'll be quickly, and I won't use up a lot of time here. Uh, anytime. He, he, he just got up here. He said a total theoretical device doesn't exist. You haven't and he read says, the research, oh, Charlie. Oh, it works. He told you how, what it does. It doesn't exist. It ran it, for anything that doesn't me. exist. How and come he describes the 60s for 200 what hours, Charlie? Are. This is amazing. It doesn't exist. There is no operational reactor anywhere on Earth. Yeah. So I guess it can do no, anything no. you want it does. Norwegian yeah. just opened one up. It doesn't exist no, anywhere. We we just opened thing up thing one of in Norway, with, Charlie. Is, I studied archaeology over a number of years, and there's been any number of ancient civilizations which have disappeared, cities which we don't know why they were evacuated. Um, 
uh, conditions have precipitated migrations on a massive scale. To date, we don't know what precipitated those. What some civilizations such as the ancestral, the Anasazi, uh, the mound builders of the Cahokia, we just don't know. And now we find ourselves in a thing, and I'm amazed that we're precipitating the end of our, predicting the end of our civilization. 90% um, of the population of the Earth is settled uh, near a body of water. You're entirely correct from a transportation perspective. It was, that's been done. The thing I was trying to get to is there is an inherent problem in, in climatology is that there's a correlation is you have an event here, an event here, and you say they're connected. Well, that's not necessarily the case. The fact that I tap the top of my head and an, and an airplane flies does not mean tapping my head causes airplanes to fly. Now, causality is a clear, difficult thing to establish. And especially when you're dealing with variables like how much sunlight is hits the Earth. How do you measure this? You cannot conduct an experiment, maybe on a small scale, and then you to extrapolate to the thing. I, got, I went to a school, too, and I got a degree. Look at See there? I got credentials, pal. Um, <laughs> Now, the last thing is, what we're looking to do, and I've run into this as a lobbyist many, many times, is we want to affect what are known as regulations. Well, when you do so, guess who's out there? An existing industry. An industry that has people employed in that industry, has a vested interest in maintaining that industry, and you also have customers of that industry. So it's a difficult thing to often come along, and especially when you want to close one down, no matter how important it is. But anyhow, that was a really good program, and I enjoyed it. And get involved in the project, if not this group, some other group of Chicago Greens, 350, any of them will do. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Yeah, anytime, pal. <laughs> how can I argue you're not existent? You just haven't it's looked like at your facts, Charlie. The attributes of a pixie. You had to have a look at the facts. Oh, Paul, as a pixie. As long as you want it to be. I'm going to say one word. You forgot to We're going to need to solve this problem. Get out on Tuesday or before and vote. Correct. All right, Andy, I know you've got something to say. We've got, we've got a clock here for you, so uh, go ahead. Our speaker will then uh, end it with her final remarks. You'll have in about three minutes. So you'll have the last word. But you have the last word. Number one, if you want to know what's going on, log on to the website called Common Dreams. It's the best of the best blend of all kinds of things of what's happening uh, and good things, solutions. There's an army of young people forming worldwide that our press doesn't cover. Are you familiar with the Sunrise Movement yet? It's totally blacked out in the United States. It's an army of young people. They've already endorsed, and they're knocking on doors for like 20 progressive candidates. The movement's been up and running for over a year that I know of. I found it two weeks ago. Second thing is there's a lawsuit that's going forward. A bunch of young people sued the federal government for foreclosing on their future. And that's going to be heard in the federal court sometime soon uh, over the objections of Kavanaugh. The Earth is being terraformed, changed. The Earth will be here for millions of years, but as this article shows here, the climate scientists, uh, Al Gore, everybody else, they're now admitting that their computer models are wrong. They've been wrong every year for the last 25 years because when they get the numbers for the next year, they have to revise it. It's happening faster. The ice is melting faster than what they thought, right? You saw that too in the you know, reports over the last yeah, 15 years? Yeah. Yeah. So, in uh, answer to building uh, new energy sources that can get off of fossil fuel, this article lays it out. We got 12 years or it's over. If we don't get off of fossil fuel massively, cutting fossil fuel use in half by 2030, then what she talked about, oceans rising, uh, getting a little warmer, it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle, and then the planet is just going to warm up four or five degrees more, and there's nothing we can do about it. 2030 right now is the target date. Next year, that might be revised down to 2028, 2027. Each year, they get better numbers <clears throat> about how fast 
everything is happening with methane. They're, wor they're worried about a huge methane bomb in Russia if the permafrost melts. The methane coming up is going to be 20 times worse than carbon dioxide, right? Uh, one thing is invention. One of the reasons that the American public is having such a problem with this. Chapter 11 in this book, unprecedented, it's called Climate Change Denial. We are up against an army of intellectual, highly paid intellectual prostitutes that are giving the women prostitutes a bad name. These people are paid to tell us there's no harm with tobacco smoke. <laughs> the same people that uh, created denial on tobacco, they shifted over to climate change in the year, uh, you know, uh, that was the long they shifted time. over in 1994 and became climate denialists. So log on to Common Dreams, log on to Truth Out, Smirking Chimp, those three are running sites on this climate stuff every single day of the week. Uh, the best of the best. And anybody, I've got cards with those websites on it. If anybody wants one, let me know. Thank you. Okay, that's it for tonight. Uh, so our, our speaker is just the last word. word. It's the last word. That's it for yes. the rebuttals right now. Wow. Our speaker, Nancy, yeah. uh, do the best you can to summarize uh, if you want to answer any critics. Because <laughs> yeah. you had a wife and some critics here. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today, and it was very nice to even meet everybody. Um, in regards to the nuclear energy, I think some of the slides that got missed near the end, I was discussing actually, um, I didn't get to discuss how they are developing new solutions to storage for the wind and the solar energy, mm -hmm. yes, um, making them way more efficient and yes. affordable. So unfortunately I did not get to talk about that. Um, in regards to climate change and to promoting the message, um, I do agree that saving the planet is kind of a silly thing to say and it's kind of cliche. But focusing on our children, on health care, on people's money, things that are most important to people, uh, that they hold dearly to their hearts, is the way to really convince people and to have mo modify their way of thinking. So um, thank you again. And if you want to keep in touch with me, I have business cards, and you're welcome to take one. Can you give right, us your uh, right. web address for the Chicago, uh, for the Chicago chapter? Um, I believe it's just um, crp-chicago-us. Okay. That's the Chicago chapter right there. All right. What is that? crp-chicago-us. You can reach our speaker through that website. I'm on there and speakers. Okay. Well, let's take a look real quick. Well, you want to contact the organization. Yes. <laughs> Anybody on the Right there. But yeah, I work with all of those people and uh, we do presentations all over the Chicagoland area. That's great. That's great. That's great. Let's give one more hand for our speakers. Andy can keep your gin and gentle us out. Thank you for a wonderful presentation tonight. Uh, come back. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Have a good walk. So I'm going to be walking out here when it comes to this job. So what should we be doing?